So I'm going to talk about uh, tipping buckets that we've been using at our CPAC Southeast Purdue Ag Center project um, since about 1982. They were originally designed by Dr. Ed Monk in the Ag Engineering Department at, at Purdue. Since that time, they've been adapted and maintained by field staff at, at CPAC. Um, so uh, tipping bucket uh, drain flow is essentially the same idea as a tipping bucket rain gauge. It's simply counting the number of tips, uh, each of which are a known volume of water. Um, one of the criteria for using a tipping bucket in this application is that you have to have appreciable fall at the end of the field where you want to do the measurement, um, about three feet or a meter, and the ability to have a small structure or a cover over the hole where the tipping bucket is sitting. And I'll show you pictures of that here in a minute. Um, a colleague of mine did this slide back a number of years ago. I refound it. Uh, I certainly didn't do this automation, but we're counting up tips. After two tips, we take a sample. We have another uh, water coming through. We get another two tips, and that triggers the sample. So the idea here is just that we're we're linking our tipping bucket with our uh, sampling. Uh, we certainly count more than two tips, tips before we take a sample, but that just kind of gives you uh, an illustration of that. So we've used it for uh, a research field on drain spacing um, where we have different tile drain spacings. The slope of that field is is pretty flat at less than really less than about a half a percent, um, but the the uh, the the outlets of the drains um, down at the bottom of the field where we actually have the appreciable fall, I don't know if I can point with this, is, is uh, way down, down here where our main drain goes into a ditch. And we have um, a lot of uh, fall there. And that's what enabled us to use this tipping bucket system. Um, so our main drain for example, was installed here pretty deep um, along the highway because where it outlets down probably a couple hundred meters further down um, was significantly lower in elevation. So it allowed us to put this main drain pretty deep. Our laterals then went up into the field um, and each of the laterals, uh, you can barely see the tile here, but the last 10 feet um, went into uh, PVC pipe, which then went into this culvert. Um, so you can see here that the, the pipe uh, that's connected to the lateral that's coming from the field is entering um, here at about three feet below the soil surface. Um, and then the, the little stub of a drain that goes out to the main drain is located about three feet lower than that. Um, and so that conducts water from that manhole to the main drain. Um, in the meantime, these all have a concrete floor. But so basically we have fall here because our main drain was able to be deep enough because our ditch was uh, that we were emptying into was considerably uh, lower in elevation. So then we installed this tipping bucket. The tipping bucket's just sitting on the floor of the manhole. Uh, the water, uh, this is just a, a splash guard up here. The water accumulates on, on the one half of the tipping bucket and then it tips um, and the water just goes onto the concrete floor and then out that little stub of a, of a drain to the main drain. We have uh, used ISCO water samplers. Obviously, there are many different varieties available, but we've used ISCO water samplers. So this tube basically goes out down, down into that <clears throat> into that PVC pipe, um, and we program it to take samples on a flow proportional basis based on tips. So maybe every 25 tips, it takes a sample. Another 25 tips, it takes a sample. Um, usually the, the samples just go into one big jug in the middle of the sampler, but occasionally we have used the 24 bottle mode when we've looked at pesticide studies, for example. Um, <clears throat> the, because this is at a research farm, um, the, the, the guys there work, uh, you know, five days a week. And so every morning, one of the, one of the staff goes out and empties the, the water sampler and if necessary, reprograms it. So um, I use 25 tips as an example. 
Um, we program it for every 25 tips, take a sample, every 25 tips, take a sample. On Fridays before the weekend or when expecting big storms, he reprograms it to, to go every 50 tips or every 100 tips. And of course is recording how he has that programmed um, for each day. We've tended to have tip counts go directly to both the data logger and to the ISCO for field redundancy in case one or the other of these fail. <clears throat> the flow conditions um, where this works or doesn't work, <laughs> the key point is that the tipping bucket can't be submerged. Um, it doesn't tip when it's underwater. Um, this did happen at our site in later years uh, where the manholes became flooded during high flow events. Um, so the laterals were generally still flowing, at least for a while, but we couldn't measure that flow. <laughs> Um, the reasons for the flooded manholes uh, don't really pertain to this, this webinar, but it was probably a combination of faster flow in the field with time and also some partial blockage downstream in the main. But regardless, we couldn't measure the flow once the tipping bucket was underwater. Um, <clears throat> in later years, it also um, kind of dawned on me that we need to remember that these laterals are entering a manhole. They're totally unrestricted flow. When the, when the manhole's not flooded. <clears throat> so we have a pipe, it's open-ended and it um, has nothing restricting the flow. And so that in fact might be a little bit faster flow than would have really occurred in the field if it had been connected directly to a main, which is of course the, the real field situation. Um, and that main may also restrict flow in many of our fields under many conditions. So we never really saw that uh, because it wasn't connected. So our flooded manholes maybe ended up being a little bit closer to what kinds of conditions we might have had in the field. But nonetheless, we still couldn't measure the flow. That was the problem. <clears throat> the limits for the instrumentation is really at the high flow end, how fast the buckets can actually accumulate water and tip. Um, when we had very high flow, we had every few seconds uh, where they were tipping. Um, at low flow, the limits are really if leaks have developed with time where you're losing water, maybe uh, just as fast or at least appreciable water before it accumulates enough to, to tip. Um, and that's not generally a problem, but, but um, that can develop. So my, my last slide is just a little bit more on the challenges and the level of difficulty. Um, really, it's relatively easy technology. All you're doing is counting tips, um, but tipping buckets are not off the shelf. You need to design them for the size, for the amount of flow that you expect. You need a machine shop to be able to build them for you. Um, the details of construction and maintenance repair are primarily mechanical issues, but they can be significant. Um, this includes the materials and the strength to withstand this repeated rapid banging of the um, of the tipping bucket as the water's flowing quickly, um, cushioning that impact, but not so much so that you cause bounce and double counting of sensors, which we did have trouble with um, at some times. Leaks sometimes do develop and welding them to repair that can cause warp and that can change your calibration. Um, eventually parts break, particularly the axle. Um, the proper height to mount the sensors if you do have a little bit of bounce in the in the tipping bucket and infield calibration is relatively easy you just basically need a tank um, that's that's graduated in in um, gallons and and how much time it takes and how many tips you get um, <clears throat> i might be forgetting one time but i think ours lasted about 15 years and then we built new ones for another 15 years and even if i forgotten that there was another one in there that would be 10 years which is you know pretty good um, <laughs> Certainly some repairs were needed along the way, but overall, they're, if they're built ruggedly to begin with, um, they can last pretty well. <clears throat>